Welcome to All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light driving scientific innovation in the 21st century. I'm Joel Williams, Associate Editor at Photonics Media. Join us as we explore the latest trends in optics, lasers, microscopy, and spectroscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape, brought to you by Photonics Media. Three and a half years ago, All Things Photonics kicked off its second season with a deep dive into all things silicon photonics. Columbia University's McCall Lipson joined the podcast. In one of our most downloaded episodes, the industry luminary overviewed what we termed an emergent technology. That phrasing, selected intentionally, served to indicate that silicon photonics was an industry-shaping technology area that had advanced from industry future status to the industry present innovation. Perhaps conflated with integrated photonics technology, our chat with Dr. Lipson ventured all things photonics into topics such as AR, quantum computing, and lab-on-a-chip technology. Our programming in the subsequent six seasons has explored those topics and many others in greater depth. All the while, Silicon Photonics, as Episode 1, Season 2 rightly declared, has charged ahead and in the fast lane. As we conclude Season 8 in today's episode, we once again welcome a Silicon Photonics luminary to the podcast. Joyce Poon is director of the Max Planck Institute of Microstructure Physics and a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Toronto. One month after our episode with Dr. Lipson aired in 2020, Poon and colleagues, including Dirk England, Wim Bogarts, and Francesco Morichetti, published the acclaimed Nature paper titled Programmable Photonic Circuits. It was a simple title for an ambitious pursuit, and one which has gained traction in the last year with first-of-their-kind commercial offerings, and something resemblant of a roadmap for next steps. Poon identifies her current focus as short wavelength silicon photonics, working with less than one micron deliverables beyond the O and C bands. Applications in sensing, bio, and quantum are abundant. So too are those in datacom. It is here, in and around the data center, that a conversation about AI and silicon photonics breaks out, led by perhaps the one person most equipped to lead it. Like Lipson in 2020, Poon, now into 2024, guides listeners through the present landscape of a field with unrivaled insights. This episode, a must-listen as we wind down Season 8, is a gateway into our future, not only as photon fanatics, but as citizens of a world in which the phrase integrated on silicon is indicative of technological sophistication beyond that which material science as we know it has ever supported. I wanted to begin the conversation by asking you, just in the time since that paper came out, where have you noticed progress in that area? Because there has been some on the commercial side, um, but certainly more on the research side as well. That's right. So yeah, it's been really an exciting three years since that paper came out, and, and that paper is extremely well cited. And I think the big um, change in the past three years is that We've now been able to create and control very large photonic integrated circuits. So, so this is definitely a big uh, game changer. And of course, what it took was uh, much better fabrication, you know, better yield, and also lots of advances in packaging and integration. And um, and also some companies, of course, trying to do um, a very large, even wafer scale photonic circuits um, for interconnects uh, for computing. So that's very exciting. So all of that's driving. Uh, the technology forward. And I think that there there can be a lot done still. Um, and, and really the, the excitement around this is around the, the application of these large photonic circuits uh, for computing using light. Um, one of them is some more classical approaches and, and also very much driven by the interest in machine learning these days. Uh, happy to discuss uh, further later. And also the other axis is uh, for quantum computing. Yeah, it's an interesting point because you mentioned um, the, this advent of machine learning enabled capabilities. I, I guess my question is, how does that tie into what's actually now being sent out in the commercial space? I mean, you alluded to, I think it was the iPronix offering. Um, what their commercial offering is, 
uh, is probably not what it can be. I mean, there's always going to be room to incorporate new technologies mm -hmm. and advance one, the current product, but also establish new product. How are these, these emerging technology areas such as um, ML converging with what we're seeing now just entering the commercial space? Right, so I can. I think it's a. It's definitely a big question. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, no and I, I maybe from we can start off with uh, maybe from from the industry side, like things are already out there or are very close to uh, being commercialized. Uh, so as close as the current need, and then and then back and then gonna kind of step back and see yeah. the other yeah, opportunities. Good. So, so uh, I think as I'm sure a lot of listeners uh, might be aware uh, because of this uh, growth of, of machine learning. And we're doing this interview right after this entire fiasco yeah, of yeah. AI. So for those of you listening yeah. to today, it's been an interesting weekend. Yeah. Um, but, but it just sort of uh, illustrates how um, how important this technology is, right? That that uh, it grips the world. Like, by, yeah. <laughs> like all hanging on. Yeah, we spent so much time trying to bring photonics to the world and then something like this happens and you know you, you hope that photonics does kind of get lost in this fiasco. <laughs> we were part of that we're behind the scenes supporting yeah. a lot of this infrastructure of course and and so we can just see how how critical this is to the to the world um and and to to allow for the infrastructure to be deployed and for us to to continue scaling and to sort of realize the full potential of ai then there, there will have to be um, better networking um, on at all all kinds of levels within these compute systems. So, um, so they, within the data centers, right? But you know, longer so kilometer uh, long links, but also much shorter distances um, within within a rack, uh, maybe even within one one plane, like one of the drawers in the rack. So. So along those lines, and then the photonics is really in this traditional space of enabling the the low energy, uh, power efficient, so power efficient, high bandwidth uh, communication. Right. So this is uh, happening, and and this is really the I think the first landing point <laughs> for photonics in this computing era, um, and it's happening already. And then, and then a little bit uh, um, more, you know, exploratory, and then people are still thinking about that. It would be um, whether to actually do computing uh, in the optical domain. And there, a very specific uh, example that has, you know, I think taken a lot of us researchers by storm, is a very energy efficient uh, inference, uh, the inference part of machine learning. So. Um, and inference is what we usually uh, do. So machine learning, the two parts, you train a model, then you have to, uh, then you you ask the model to to take the input and give you the output. So the inference part is 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 that second part, um, and and inferencing is what actually most of the daily use you know, for normal people. <laughs> we, we were using the average person is is using uh, ML in, with the inference side, not not on the training. And so there, uh, there, the idea of doing you using some maybe physical implementation, you know, trying to do it in physics uh, to do the inference can potentially give a very high um, uh, a gain in the efficiency. So less, a lot less power, maybe do it much faster. So this is um, th there's a lot of these uh, smaller photonic uh, kind of companies and startups that are exploring that. Um, and also lots of research papers are in this uh, area. So so that's that part. And then, so this is, it will take longer to see how those technologies and that research translate to commercialization. You know, there's some early, there's some startups trying to do that, um, but but I, I mean, it's hard. I, I don't think they, they're like being in heavy use uh, right now. In, 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 def in their defense, it is a lot of work. <laughs> yes, correct, yeah. So, so it's pretty exciting, and then, um, and then, then, the, and then, of course, as I mentioned, then the the longer term view would be well, okay. So this is the the ML, the machine learning, or machine intelligence era, and um, photonics is also very important for supporting um, even longer term computing, like a quantum computer. That there's lots of optics there, and in order for those systems to eventually scale out and um, you know, they, they will because if, if you think about it, eventually those those very will come. They'll also have to be in some kind of data center type of environment. They, they have to be networked, so there has to be lots of um, integration that will to, to allow them to to go beyond being physics experiments. Um, and and there, 
integrated photonics and these programmable photonic uh, circuits because you would want to program computers and programmable uh, photonic circuits will, will also be um, an enabling um, uh, so hardware uh, on the optic side for for that kind of compute. So a couple couple things uh, to to build on that response, uh, but I want to start with something you mentioned earlier in the response, and that's quantum. Um, we hear about you know the need for maybe down the road, the not so distant future, the need for a dedicated quantum integrated photonic foundry. There's some really interesting work being done, um, both in Europe, the U.S., and probably elsewhere too, uh, in that space. Just a, a question for you specifically. How do you view that intersection between quantum technology and integrated photonic technology? Because you're bridging two two areas that are, uh, there's some separation there, but you're tying them together. And it's kind of quite exciting, both for compute and just the physics of it. Right. I, I think they're not so far apart. So of course, it sounds very far, but but depending on, on what we, we, we're thinking about, so the, the a lot of quantum computers today, or some of the, the um, uh, more exciting, uh, the very dense integration <laughs> type of quantum computers um, are actually based on atoms and ions. So really <laughs> using atomic systems. And and for many, many years, that, that, that field has always been, uh, you know, has always involved using light to control these atoms and ions um, to create so-called optical traps and also to to then also to you know um, to, to actually hold the atoms on the eyes and also to be to and also to to address the electronic states. So so optics has always been part of this. So if you go to any atomic molecular optic AMO physicist lab, so these are the physicists that work in this field is full of lasers and free space optics. Um, so so I think it's not so far and and there's a lot of um, room for for trying to to integrate that and and to not only just the the tabletop optics, but that they use a lot of optical instruments like like lasers, like really narrow line with lasers, very stable lasers to to control the atoms and so on. So all of that, uh, if you if you have one physics experiment, that's fine. But what if you now need to have not even, I'm not even going to put the word 100. If you need 10 of them <laughs> in, a, in a manageable, you know, area, you would you would start to consider thinking, I, I might need some chips here. So, mm. so this is not so far. Um, it, it's, it's just doing bulk, so bulk optics, we use chips. And then the other, uh, maybe more exploratory, longer term um, um, type of work would be to actually use the photons themselves um, as the quantum uh, bits, and uh, I think I think many people already think that you would need to have single photon um, as the uh, photons as the carrier of quantum information when you link two quantum computers together. So that just like how we use light classically to communicate, but in, also in quantum systems that will likely be the case. But then the the, the longer term um, and other potential applications actually using the photons themselves to do the computation, and and so that that's um, I would say a longer term um, type of um, exploration. Is there a, a roadmap or anything close to it, uh, just in terms of the quantum integration stuff? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's certainly a, a new technology, but I ask because so much of our talk about PICS is grouping it to a microelectronics roadmap, but I'm not sure if the relationship that quantum had with, with the microelectronics side is uh, a direct parallel to what we see with quantum and photonics. Um, maybe a better question is where are we going in the quantum space and, and when are we going to get there? Um, I think that uh, there is, to my knowledge, there's no, we, we don't have a common roadmap, but we all agree um, as researchers that there, there will have to be um, improvements in um, reducing optical losses in the waveguides. In some instances, the, some materials, they, they fluoresce, and so that a very weak fluorescence will, will constitute as a noise, right? So you, you have to improve the materials, you have to improve the fabrication. Um, and then the yeah, operation in maybe cryogenic environments, like how reliable are these devices? How do you package <laughs> in, in these? Um, can, can you can you epoxy the work, etc.? So all of this is um, is still I would say it's open and it's part of the. Um, I mean we all understand we have to do this uh, and and also expanding into different wavelengths. So quantum systems 
um, a lot of the atomic uh, um, systems, and so they, they don't use telecom <laughs> wavelength. So so we have to move to shorter wavelengths. So so working on it, uh, th there's no general roadmap, but uh, but every but, but you know everyone in the community is trying to do their best to advance. It, where is what? What's the measurement or the gauge for success in that very specific <laughs> space? Because it may not be, uh, you know, making money or spinning out companies. It may very well be making society better in a very innovative way. You know, where do you see or what do you see as the 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 measurement for success in this area of technology? Because there's potential to change the world, um, <laughs> and and that's probably more meaningful than just about anything else. Um. Good point, but I think the VCs when they when they put the money in, they they don't think that they will make money. <laughs> so, so there is, a, but I don't, yeah. I'm not sure if if it's that benevolent. <laughs> 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 it may be wishful thinking. <laughs> it's an interesting yeah. point. I mean, it, it is just, it's always interesting to hear the view of this intersection between really high level R&D and commercialization. Um, it's, um, it's, it always yields an interesting response. Um, we'll focus on your area of research because it gives you the chance to, to bring very distinct technologies together, right? Like silicon photonics and neurotech. Uh, yeah. And if you wanted to go into wearables, you could do that just given the nature of the work that you do. Yeah. Um, but less than um, one micron silicon photonics, right? So we're talking applications in data, sensing, bio, quantum, beyond the O and the C bands, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's the origin of this interest for you? Because it, it's another one of the, these, these pieces of this larger technology with some really interesting applications. That's right, yeah. So I, I got interested in doing integrated photonics on silicon. It's still silicon photonics, actually, because it's made in a silicon photonic foundry. So it's completely compatible with the uh, foundry processes um, uh, for these visible and uh, infrared. So less than, wavelength less than one micron, um, I would say around seven years ago, 2016 or so. And and at the time, um, we, we were very motivated, it was very motivated to to develop uh, brand new tools for neuroscience. Um, so these are brain implants, to be precise, and and it's pretty out there scientifically. But as I started to you know, to to explore this and, and thought about this um, more and more, work on this more and more, and I, I think the opportunity is very exciting because there are many um, applications, as you as you mentioned, these um, uh, for health and sensors. Um, also displays, um, as an example, quantum systems. So these right. these other types of applications that are, and some of them are even in the consumer side. Uh, right. Right? And we should be clear too, just sorry to interrupt you, we should be clear too that when we're talking sensing, it's not exclusively biosensing, like it's a wide oh, it's range of different bio. sensing. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it could be even um, uh, depth mapping. Yep. So if we, yeah, you know, the, the, there's a lot of optics that happens outside of the O and C band. Um, and in fact, probably if you look at all of the applications of optics, I think most of them are are in the visible and infrared range. And even in the in the space of data communications, look at look at the huge success of Vixels. And they're all at the you know Galley Marsnai base, 850 nanometer, 900 something nanometer, uh, and and the and also the depth mapping sensors in 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 our phones now even. So so the the interest there. Then I started really oh there there are lots of applications for for photonic circuits um, in these in these shorter wavelength ranges, and in fact in these shorter I I think well, some some of them being even commercial applications can have a huge potential for silicon photonics uh, in the future. So I, I'm not a, I'm not a, a business person or something like that, but, but um, to one, one thing that I've always observed in, in integrated photonics is that of course we, we, we've been very much focused on the on the telecommunications I mean we come from this fiber optic sort of heritage. And so so, um, so we, we focus a lot on that um, but but the, um, the the use cases uh, at these very narrow, a uh, very specific wavelength band, so dictated by the properties of an optical fiber, is you know they they're not so they actually comparatively I feel narrow uh, to all of the applications in 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 optics and um, and this is what actually I think is one of the 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 challenges the difficulties of 
of the continued growth um, of uh, photonics, uh, silicon photonics, uh, the, the, the sort of more traditional conventional flavor, is just that the volumes are not that high uh, for manufacturing, for, for it to be like in electronics, like, you know, you keep bringing, you, know, you sort of highlighted that, like, is photonics like microelectronics? Like, it's not, uh, because we, we don't, we, we, we don't have these really broad use cases. The volumes are, and then silicon photonics, like these transceivers are probably already the most successful, <laughs> the highest volume <laughs> type of um, uh, photonic uh, circuits and integrated photonic products that are out there. But but from a microelectronics perspective, like, you know, our volumes are, are like completely negligible. <laughs> uh, so. So I think I, I hope that there would be um, that that there would be some applications that that can harness really this integration of a lot of optical and also some electronic function on the chip. And I think those applications are are not <laughs> likely going to be in in the data, just not in the not only in the data communication side, and um, and at the 1.3 and 1.5 micron bands. And I think exploring this, yeah, some of these applications, we'll see how how they they develop. Uh, working on the shorter wavelength ranges have their own, you know, the, the, these shorter wavelengths have their own challenges um, to to get the the fabrication and the test and then so on, uh, right? So it will take time, but I, I think we can. There's a potential of unlocking some uh, major uh, applications a bit beyond my original sort of scientific one. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because you mentioned this this optical fiber framework mm. um, and, and the need to maybe not overcome it, but certainly advance from it. And that isn't to say that optical fiber innovation isn't taking place. Mm. Uh, I just think on the medical side, uh, but it's true. And you think about companies like Anello Photonics and, and certainly the brain power there is great. I mean, it gets considerable, but the, the you know, the possibility to advance gyroscopy away from optical fiber into silicon photonics, that's impressive work. Um, was there always this, this need or this desire to move beyond fiber? Like when you were starting out, was that always an ambition or was that something that happened um, maybe more by chance or serendipitously? Um, well, for me, yeah. Like when, you know, I feel like when I pick projects, it's, it's sort of, um, um, like the, the two ways. So one one is like was the 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 potential application, um, and then at the same time, sort of my own uh, my own curiosity or my own maybe unsettled feeling about a, a certain topic. Um, and and for this one, certainly for this um, uh, uh, non um, telecom fiber, yeah, this yeah of course there are many types of fibers, but let's say non SMF twenty eight <laughs> of application could have done a better um, job clarifying that. <laughs> This this one this one um, yeah it has always bugged me a bit like why why um, why is why are there so few applications of mm -hmm. <laughs> so kind of photonics and we try very hard right you know, let's let's do lidar but of course if you look at all of lidar um, there's actually the the, the uh, uh, velodyne and so on the, the conventional lidar does not work at <laughs> fifteen fifty so it always feels like yeah we 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 are. You, we were kind of pigeonholed into a couple of um, of bands. So so some of it's just my own personal thinking, like why are we always there? Because it's the kid fiber, my own sort of discomfort. And then the other, of course, is also looking at some applications that I think are very interesting and will really push um, what we need to do further. Um, and so then we would have some ideas and 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 set out to, to address a, a, a topic uh, a, with an application actually uh, but even though maybe our realization is not so near term like in, in when it turns when it comes to commercialization but we, we do have goals um, and we would try to address those those goals and tie to applications yeah and you of all people are probably like the most qualified to answer this just given uh, you and other research group leaders in this space um, because you are really familiar with the technology but also responsible for advancing it um you know the technology quite well at this point mm -hmm. so it begs the question are you thinking more about an outcome or an end user goal when you're um commencing a project or are you thinking about just the the, the natural interest in bringing together different technologies what's the mindset <laughs> um i i think of the um, that is both, I have to say. Yeah, definitely the, the application um, is interesting and it may, and then they're always very challenging. 
uh, yeah, there has to be some challenge, and it's uh, we 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 are not in a position to to do well, you know whether you know with with PhD students and so on. We, we can never compete with a company um, uh, head on. So we we try to look for new um, new areas, right, in which we could oh you know can can integrative photonics play here. So I would say yeah, we we are um, thinking about the yeah some. Like in the mind, it's like how do I even motivate my students, right? I, I think my students would want to see this in application. It cannot be just for fun, <laughs> uh, <laughs> for no reason. Um, there will be application. Um, and and then at the same time, because we work with foundries a lot, we also have to convince them that there would have to be some kind of uh, market uh, in the long term. But otherwise, why would they work with us? Um, so so we also would, um, even though maybe we, we think long term, but we make also a case like that, yeah, this there could be these potential markets that this uh, R and D and so on can can address like near term, and and then um, so we 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 quite um, we have to be quite practical, um, and, but at the same time we we are we are more free than a company, that, and then so we we're able to explore so so uh, and and also motivated by oh some personal type of or maybe taste <laughs> and, and interest in, in the problem. So it, it's a mix of, 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 of the, the kind of two sides, like the internal side and the kind of the, the, the external um, uh, prompting, if you wish. Yeah, I, I mean, you you are working with foundries. Let's make that yes. that clear. It, that's not just something that those on the business side uh, mm -hmm. do. Um, have those conversations, those dialogues with foundries changed over the last few years as the technology has advanced? Are you getting the sense that there's more eagerness uh, to take on certain projects? Because foundries are are kind of kind of odd, right? There are some foundries that have nothing to do with certain materials. And it's it, this is not a, a fault of any kind. That's just the nature of how foundries work. Yeah. So over time, I, I would say that um, uh, foundries, uh, the silicon photonics ones, have um, it seems actually have gone less exploratory. But more trying to to um, uh, consolidate, and of course you could always uh, make special requests and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, you, there better be extremely good justifications uh, for this. And um, I think it's not a secret. You know, if you go to OFC and so on, you can hear uh, from from the other foundry, um, uh, from, from different foundries, they, yeah, because they're so, because photonics has always tradition, well, has been traditionally very heterogeneous, uh, very diverse. And so um, they, they, they see a lot of requests and they, I think a lot of them are just hoping that some, that there'll be more consolidations easier on their side. Right. And to be able to manage. So actually, over time, I would I, I, I would have to say that um, they're becoming um, uh, yeah, tr I wouldn't say less flexible. You can always do something, but um, but certainly the, the there has to be a good uh, business case. Much of your work, both now and in the past, has will fall into what we would consider multi-material um, mm -hmm. integrated photonics. Uh, Two-part question: How did that emerge as a focus area for you? And then follow up to that: Where's the opportunity now? Right. So, for myself, um, I have always thought that there would be multiple materials, and and the reason for that is that um, when uh, so I, when, when I started as a professor, so 2007, um, so silicon photonics was was getting very, was become uh, increasingly popular, and but I never understood why you have to guide light in the silicon. Like I just didn't get it. Like why? It's not the best optical mm -hmm. material you could have. So so in my mind at the time, like well there has to, I would I was really trying to think about doing silicon nitride as material to as a as the primary passive wave guide material. And then um, using the silicon um, maybe for, for modulation and, de and, and having a, the detector. So even in the data comm, uh, telecom application. So, so in my view, I, it never seemed to me that silicon would be the end. Like it would never be a single material. And, and at that time already, uh, back even, I think it was 2005 or so, that was the first the hybrid lasers um, were coming out of robots group in Ghent and uh, and um, UC Santa Barbara John Bowers group. They were already bonding three five on silicon. So so even at that moment we um, at least um, I think I and, and people that uh, at the time were going, I mean uh, I mean many, many of us would have seen that oh, silicon or, or, or you know it could never be one material even if we 
try to um, uh, hone in on the silicon um, as being a, a sort of a big wafer platform to to realize photonic circuits that the uh, lasers I mean there, there were this export there was a lot of research on on doing lasers in silicon and and um, and germanium and silicon and mm -hmm. so on but they were never you yeah it's an indirect bank cap material so so it's um yeah, it, you, they, they, they make for interesting research but it would make no sense <laughs> it seems so so I, I think that um at least the story of uh, uh, at least sitting on on a silicon substrate and if we were to we really want to leverage this um infrastructure uh the microelectronics and the infrastructure to make photonics which is the whole goal of silicon photonics i think in, in my view then then it was i i think it, yeah it couldn't have been one material mm -hmm. i got a clarifying question here and this builds on what we were talking about a, a little bit earlier but it's quantum computing and, and i suppose it's quantum computing versus optical computing um, the line gets blurred between the two quite a bit just through a photonics lens and I, I have to think it's because the bottlenecks are similar and the bottlenecks that both aim to overcome um, are similar. So hoping that you could provide our listeners with a, a differentiation between the two um, because the line does get blurry, blurry and it may be a better way of thinking about this is what are we working on in optical computing and is there a difference between what we're working on in quantum computing? Um. Yeah, they they are they are a little bit different as uh, and as the field sort of uh, understands uh, right now. Although I, I think they they are also very much um, uh, connected in terms of the actual technology. So one will benefit from the other. Um, so the optical computing. Um, so I'm I'm going to take out the part with data center, the the data communication, which I. I think is much more conventional and in common. So yeah, th those are the usual um, uh, trying to make better modulators, laser integration, co-package optics. All that. So so this is the 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 more conventional stuff. But um, in terms of the research side, like I said, yeah, there's a lot of interest in uh, applying um, some kind of physical hardware. Actually, it doesn't even have to be optics. But um, but since this is an optics photonics podcast, we can talk about photonic implementation. Um, yeah, the idea would be to to reduce the the power and the and the and the uh, the latency in these inference tasks. So so those are um, so that that's really the 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 goal there. Um, it's part of the family of um, accelerators. Like so so if you were from the computing side, then. Um, uh, or maybe you, you you work in in some of these AI companies and they uh, and also electronics. So so there are many ways to try to do um, machine learning acceleration, and 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 there's an increasing sort of interest in developing custom hardware. So it could be electronics, it could be something else, but uh, it could be a photonic chip to be able to to do very specific tasks um, really fast and and that, and with really high energy efficiency. So, um, so out of that, so because of some papers that have come out, actually come out of MIT originally, um, Marin Soliacic and Dirk England's group, you know, that, that was 2017 that they had shown this very early kind of demonstration of, an, of a photonic inference engine that uh, really sparked the field uh, to, to um, look at different uh, photonic circuits and uh, photonic um, implementation of uh, inferencing. And then over time, then now some people are also trying to do some training and, and, and all that. So so this is the, I mean, it's almost like a form of um, a little bit like analog uh, computing, uh, analog uh, photonic computing. So so this is um, uh, one one trajectory and it'll be quite interesting to see how how it evolves. Um, you know, of course, there are lots of naysayers that, oh, you cannot compute with light. We've tried this in the 90s and the field collapse and this is. Uh, being reinvigorated, uh, but but you know at the same time there really it's a real need, right? The the um, well, these data centers, which our friends OpenAI, etc. They use they they really they they really take entire cities worth of energy to run, and so thinking you know and this is just the infancy state, which is just the scary part. We have the infancy right. of machine learning, and. How are artificial intelligence like what is it going to be in the you know five years from now? 
So there has to be some breakthrough. And I hope that photonics is, is somehow part of this uh, solution. But of course, you, there may be some other physical implementation of really dramatically reducing the energy consumption of, of AI. So, so this is the, the, um, uh, that part of the computing, uh, the, you know, what people now call optical computing. Um, it, you know, a lot of it is around this, these sorts of ideas. Um, the, the quantum computing, uh, of course, uh, will have, as I was saying, yeah, they, they, need to, they need a lot of um, optics also to, to control the atoms and the ions and also potentially also to, um, to do the computing with photons themselves. And so they, they also need a kind of integration um, to be able to do the scaling. And so they, they both benefit, like both of these branches benefit from having, for example, very low loss photonic circuits, right? They will benefit from much more improved uh, integration, like with electronics, right? Maybe other, um, uh, uh, yeah, actually microelectronics, I think it will be the big thing um, here. They will also have to have, you know, connections to fiber. So all of the, also the, some of the mundane stuff that data column we deal with. So the mundane well, stuff in data com, right? <laughs> yeah, because at the end you you have to transmit your That's information right. out, right. and so we we don't know anything better than the optical fiber for the very high bandwidth type of connection. So. Um, so I, I, yeah, they they're not so dis, they're not so far apart. Like they look very different. Um, um, yeah, because they, and they sound very different. But the the heart of it, like the the actual chips and the tech, they they share a lot of the the same things, and they will benefit from the same advancements. You have no idea how much easier that clarification will make my job. Just <laughs> editing some of this content. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So thank you. Um, let's move um, elsewhere on the value chain. Talk about standardization for a second. Mm. And standards. Now the OIF has been quite active um, in co-package optics and, and beyond as well. Um, and a lot of that has direct application to industry, but standards certainly extend beyond uh, industry. If there's a message from the research side to, to these these governing bodies, so to speak, like the OIF, what is it? I would say that if I were talking to them that, that photonics um, still needs the heterogeneity and the diversity to meet the many functions that the technology would serve. So, so this is my main message. And, mm -hmm. and, and the, the second thing would be that, uh, yeah, I think standardization would make sense for some applications. Um, because it's better for not for photonics people, but for for the customers, I suppose. <laughs> that um, uh, but the, the, that may, I think probably a lot of it's being driven from this data com uh, optics. Uh, but I, I don't know. One has to sort of standardize the chip itself. But if you just have the inputs and outputs and so on uh, standardized, that might already be sufficient. Um, rather than going into all the the, the insides. Um, but I, as we already discussed, I think the data com um, so on. I mean, yeah, maybe it, it helps uh, someone who buys these chips to integrate into, into something else. But this is still a relatively small um, niche, I think, application uh, within the entire field um, of, of of optics and, and and photonics. Like what the the, the pick technologies can do a lot more than than just uh, data com markets. Yeah, as we speak now, you're in Germany. It, it's it's dark outside, and yes. and you know, but you're also and you, you'll you'll be in Toronto and, and yeah. so North America and Europe. That's my point. Um, mm -hmm. So you have an interesting opportunity there to work uh, in and throughout both uh, yeah. locations, and you know, both have passed Chips Act and, and legislation similar in some ways, different in, in in the details in other ways. Just as it relates to developing an integrated photonics ecosystem and fostering that ecosystem, do you notice a difference between the the EU approach and the NA approach? Uh, yeah, there there are some I I think, um, and I think by North American I, I come from Canada, so so yeah, Canada and US is also very different. Right. Um, but general speaking, I would say the EU and the US they're both investing heavily into photonics and. Um, and another related uh, uh, so semiconductor technologies. And there are lots of government subsidies, lots of um, programs, I think maybe even more in EU than in the US, 
um, trying to the, the government um, through various programs, um, agencies uh, really try to seed um, directly even give grants to to startups. Of course, the U.S. also has this SBIR program, so, so there's, there's a lot of that going on. The U.S. Uh, generally would operate through um, its defense agencies, um, yeah, uh, DARPA and so on, the, where the funding might, might actually, you know, it's funding um, uh, uh, sometimes very, very basic research, but it's through uh, the lens of, of, um, of, uh, of the security, the national security of the country. So, so that's quite interesting, and this is not uh, so common, definitely not common in Europe, not common in Canada. Um, and I think um, in Canada, uh, the, there's a, the, the, the weakness is, is that the, 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 whole, the, the whole research system and, and the, the seed stage is just completely underfunded. So I, I hope some, some listeners are from Canada. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's just completely depleted. So Canada is probably has uses its resources extremely efficiently, I would say, to be able to perform at its level. When the funding, I mean, I've just personal experience. It's like off by like an order of magnitude. Like there, there is like a ten x or more of a kind of gap. Um, so, so it makes it very difficult for for uh, Canada to. I mean, it has to to really dream very big and to engage in in something uh, longer term and with a broader vision. So this is the the Canadian weakness. Uh, the but but uh, but if you the, the strength is that then I think all the Canadians <laughs> researchers uh, they use the resources um, and we use it extremely efficiently. I I can't imagine like I mean it's just how can you do this with like one twentieth of the resources? Yeah. Um, sometimes even one one hundredth of the resources. It's like missing a, a couple of zeros. Um, and the the EU, the EU um, of course, has a, I think um, yeah I mean it, it doesn't have the military kind of a defense uh, angle uh, usually um, and uh, so so granting um, and so on will become a, you know supporting a broader range of of work um, because it, it doesn't it's not it doesn't ha- not everything has to be funneled through the the um, through to national security. Um, but the, the the U.S. system also uh, through through the you know DARPA and and the programs that it calls also uh, to, I mean it's competitive and it's tough um, but it it has the effect of kind of uniting a lot of researchers um, from around the country to 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 tackle um, the different you know challenges that are set up by the agency so it has its benefits of of bringing people together. Um, although maybe maybe it's also sometimes very very competitive, so it also drives people apart. Yeah, um, that's extreme. Yeah. I, I want to end with this, and I I, I think I'd be uh, overlooking something quite obvious if I didn't ask this question. Um, we've talked about a number of distinct technologies and applications too uh, in our discussion here. So my question is this: Is there one or two or three that you deem most critical or most interesting, um, or or I suppose most central to your goals and ambitions moving forward. Hmm. Yeah, that that's a great question. Um, I would say that uh, in the short term, so it was within the next few years, um, a few like like three or something like that. I think really critical is to advance, um, yeah, AI. I really did this. Chat GPT changed my perspective <laughs> on, on everything. Uh, this, this is, um, yeah, it, it's beyond just classifying cats and dogs. Uh, this is a hugely transformative and disruptive technology. So, so the, the um, yeah, and, and trying to fit into the, the compute ecosystem. Um, then there, there, there are of course many ways to, to dissect that, right? Whether it's the data center communication or or really like board level compute, the connecting processors to memory and different processors together, uh, a connection fabric. I think, I think in the very short term, um, that that is critical, and and it's also uh, very motivating uh, for myself. And then uh, a little bit, you know, looking um, uh, further, then I I do hope that you know one day. Um, yeah, photonic circuits can can be everywhere. Like this, this will be um, the very interesting um, so technology to contemplate because uh, even now, the integrated photonic has been with us for a long time actually. 
So um, my, my PhD supervisor uh, was uh, Emnon Yariv, and he proposed this idea in, 19, in the 1970, 1970, I think 1971. It was called, it, the, the word photonics does not exist. Uh, he called it active integrated optics, I believe at the time. And, but the idea of integrating photonics and electronics very closely together has been around for many, many decades. But even after like, you know, 40, 50, 60 years, we, we still are in this um, area where we're in these very niche applications. So I hope one day we will finally reach the point of maturity um, in, in the manufacturing and also in the you know, in our cleverness of, of what we can do so that there can be photonic circuits uh, everywhere. And I think along those lines, like I, I could imagine you know, those the, the applications you know, at that point, you know, photonics will be really a big industry. I think uh, health monitoring, yeah, the different types of sensors, maybe for for display technology. So something that that can be in in everyone's hands. Like we will deal with it every day, um, and, and in a very obvious way, not 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 just the the connection, <laughs> the fiber in, into the computer. So so that will be um, something that I'm very excited by, and and yeah, that that will be what I think is very critical actually for the field to keep growing. Um, in for the next, I don't know, <laughs> 50 years. Well, wonderful insights. Uh, we expected nothing else. Joyce, thank you so much for, for being on with us and really appreciate the time. Okay, thank you. That concludes this week's episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to our news editor, Jake Saltzman, as well as to this week's sponsors. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pitch us ideas, and let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at allthings at photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website, photonics.com. <laughs>